Welcome and happy Saturday afternoon. My name is Colleen Allen. I am with Sisters Network Incorporated located here in Houston where our headquarters is located. And today we welcome you to our webinar on our patient education and empowerment webinar, um, Black Women, Breast Cancer and Genetic Testing, Know Your Family History. We are really excited to be here today and we thank Quest for powering this important discussion, Quest Diagnostics, excuse me, uh, uh, for powering this very important conversation about genetic testing. I know we've brought this conversation to you before, but we can't talk about it enough. And you're gonna hear a very important testimonial from um, one of our panelists who I'll be introducing shortly. Um, just wanted to just again say, Thank you, ladies uh, and gentlemen, uh, for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedule to um, participate in this uh, webinar and to learn a bit, a bit more about genetic testing. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about Sisters Network Incorporated. And uh, on behalf of the National Office, I bring, bring greetings from Karen E. Jackson, uh, who was our founder and CEO, and who was a four-time 28-year breast cancer survivor, thriver, and author of uh, her recent uh, memoir uh, in the company of our in the company of my sisters, my story, my truth, which is a beautiful uh, story about how Sisters Network came to be and uh, her personal journey uh, over the last 28 years. I encourage you to uh, go on Amazon and pick that book up. It is quite the read. Um, a little bit about Sisters Network Incorporated. We are headquartered, as I mentioned, in Houston, Texas. And we are uh, very proud to be the oldest, largest, and the only national Black breast cancer organization in the country. Um, we are nearly three decades in the fight against breast cancer. Uh, we were founded in 1994 uh, by Mrs. Uh, Jackson, um, who, who saw a need to um, bring women together who are women of color. She found a void at that time. Um, and decided to take some action. And that's why Sisters Network was founded and it's burst into um, a, a, a very important voice, a national voice uh, for black women um, battling breast cancer and educating our women in general about breast health. Um, what makes us special and unique is that we have a special sisterhood that spans across the country with um, nearly 30 chapters, affiliate chapters that are run by uh, survivors who are volunteers. Um, who take time to educate ladies um, and support them in their various communities. And as you can see, we uh, have chapters in Alabama, Arizona, Florida, uh, three chapters in Florida, um, in Georgia, Illinois, uh, Massachusetts, um, uh, the greater Detroit area, Mich Detroit, Michigan area, River Rouge, uh, in New Jersey, two chapters that are in uh, Essex County, as well as Passaic, Bergen, uh, New York City, North Carolina, we have uh, two very important chapters, the Greensboro and our Triangle chapter, uh, Reading, uh, Pennsylvania is a lovely group of ladies, Memphis, Tennessee, and Nashville, Tennessee, they're doing a lot of good work there. Of course, we have our Austin and Dallas chapter that are always doing so, so such important work on behalf of Sisters Network in Texas, um, Central Virginia, and Southeast Eastern Virginia are two very strong chapters and um, a couple of our, our, our older chapters. Um, so those are some of our veterans and one of our newer chapters in the last couple of years um, is the Southwest Southeast uh, Wisconsin chapter uh, that is in Kenosha, which is outside of Milwaukee. So we thank these ladies. Um, if you're on today, we ask you just to let us know um, so we can give you a shout out. But we, without further ado, I want to get started because we have a limited amount of time and a lot of important information to start talking about. Again, today's topic is um, Black women, breast cancer, and genetic testing. Know your family history. Again, thank you to Quest Diagnostics for powering this important conversation. And uh, I will start by introducing our first speaker and presenter, uh, a friend of mine that I met when we did the State of Black Breast Cancer uh, Town Hall, and she immediately came and supported without any hesitation. So um, I'll introduce you quickly. Her name is Kate L. Wilson. She is the uh, product, uh, product director oncology of oncology for Quest Advanced and uh, uh, board certified genetic 
counselor for uh, Quest Diagnostics. Kate L. Wilson is a board certified genetic counselor with the American Board of Genetic Counseling and a licensed genetic counselor with the State of Georgia Medical Board. She completed her undergraduate degree at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. She then received her Master's of Science in Genetic Counseling from uh, University of South Carolina Medical School in Columbia, South Carolina. Prior to joining Quest Diagnostics, Kate served as an assistant, assistant professor, director of cancer genetic services at uh, the University of Texas, uh, Houston in Houston, Texas, where she successfully established four genetic counseling services in the greater Houston area. I didn't know you were in Houston, Kate. <laughs> Kate currently serves as adjunct facility faculty at Emory Genetic Counseling Program and adjunct, adjunct faculty at University of Nebraska Genetic Counseling Program. Additionally, Kate uh, currently serves as a peer reviewer with the Journal of Genetic Counseling and the Journal of Community Genetics. Thank you, Kate, for being here today, and I'm going to turn it over to you, and then I will introduce our uh, another esteemed panelist in just a moment. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. Um, so if you want to go ahead and share the slides, um, I just want to say thank you uh, for having me here today. Um, so I'm honored to, to be talking with you all. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about genetic testing um, and really the importance of family history um, and talking about um, hereditary cancer testing. Next slide. So first, I'm going to share some some stats that are, um, you know, may not be surprising to folks that are uh, on the call. Um, but I want to kind of set the stage for why we're talking about this. Um, we'll dive into what is genetic testing and genetic counselors and just kind of give you some tips on looking at your family history. Next slide. So the stats that I wanted to share really are trying to illustrate the need for um, healthcare to do better um, in the Black community, in particular Black women and breast cancer. Um, you know, we know that Black women are more likely to be diagnosed at younger ages or have triple negative breast cancer, which can be a more aggressive type of breast cancer. Younger ages and triple negative, as we'll talk about later, are kind of red flags for hereditary cancer. Um, but what we're finding is at a few different cancer centers that have actually done studies and published this, you know, 92, 93% of white women were referred for genetic counseling, um, but only 75% of black women were referred. Um, at another study where it was women with breast cancer at young ages, so younger than 50, um, about a third of black women were referred for genetic counseling and testing compared to 85% of white women. Um, there was also a study at the Ohio State University that found that only 20% of Black women had undergone testing as compared to 67%. Um, and then I think more broadly, about half of white women have heard of BRCA, which is one of the genes associated with hereditary breast cancer. Um, 11, 12% of Black women and 30% of women of other racial ethnic groups. Um, so if you'll go to the next slide, I don't say these stats to... Um, to try not to upset people, but I want to be able to show that um, there is more work to be done. Um, and a lot of it resides within the healthcare industry and the healthcare as a whole. So when I say healthcare, I'm talking about not just the testing piece, but also hospital, academic centers, clinicians. Um, so these are some areas where healthcare um, is working to do better um, and thinking about communication, addressing these barriers. Um, thinking about lack of medical coverage, barriers to early detection screening. So some of these reside in health plans and policy. Um, and then also utilizing data, you know, the technology that we have now um, to be able to look at the data and be able to show things about healthcare disparities and try to figure out what are some unique solutions that we can implement. So while healthcare as a whole is working on these different areas, what I want to talk about today is what can you do as a patient, as somebody going in or an individual um, who is supporting um, a, a brother or sister, mom going through this uh, cancer diagnosis? Next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about genetics. So the human body is made up of trillions of cells and inside each cell are what are called chromosomes. 
Um, these chromosomes are sort of like suitcases. They carry our genes and our genetic information. And genes are the instructions that tell our body how to grow and develop. Next slide. And so what happens when we're looking at our genes, um, we notice that honestly, between most people, the DNA is pretty similar and it's, it's very similar towards each other. Um, but there are some different genetic variations. That's why some people um, may have different colored eyes, right? Um, but there's some changes that could be problematic. They could increase our risk of certain diseases such as cancer. Um, so if you'll go to the next slide, when we're thinking about um, testing for hereditary cancer, what we're trying to do is look at genes and look for changes that we know increase the risk for certain cancers. Next slide. So to talk a little bit about genetic testing, this is something that anybody can do. Um, it's typically done on a blood sample or a saliva sample, and they're looking to see a change in that genetic information that could be passed along to children. Um, is it something um, that potentially either we can use certain treatments because we see that change, or we can try to prevent things um, because we can do increased screening? Um, so we use it genetic testing for a variety of things. Um, it also is used in like newborn screening. For those that have heard of that before, that's part of newborn screening. We can sometimes see how severe a condition may be in a person. Um, and a lot of times, especially in the case of oncology and cancer, we're looking for changes that may be treatable by a certain drug or chemotherapy. Next slide. So the process, it's up to the individual. It's a personal decision. Um, you can discuss it with your healthcare provider or genetic counselor. I will say that some providers are more understanding and savvy about genetic testing than others. Um, so not every genetic or not every provider has that genetic knowledge, um, which is why we talk about genetic counselors. Um, really, the, the process is to think about your personal family history. Do you have any red flags that we'll talk about? Like I said, it's performed on blood or saliva. Um, so you spit into a tube um, and um, it looks at these genes associated with certain cancer types. Um, one of the concerns that people have with genetic testing um, is the cost. Um, most insurance plans cover genetic testing. Um, of course, there may be things like deductible that may apply, um, but typically if an individual meets certain criteria, um, the insurance has pretty good coverage. The other thing that people worry about is health insurance discrimination. There are a few protections in place for health care or for health insurance. So GINA is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. That's a federal um, law that says that your genetic information cannot be used to um, change health care premiums or to change your employment status. And then HIPAA, which um, is uh, the, the one that kind of protects our private information, um, it also um, has provisions in place about what health insurances can or can't request. The other thing about genetic testing is if you do it and something's found, and let's say you do need additional screening, like additional mammograms or an MRI, um, it can be helpful to have that genetic testing result for the insurance because then they can cover um, some of these additional services. Um, I will say that there are plenty of genetic testing labs um, and nonprofit organizations that offer financial assistance for uninsured or underinsured patients as well. Next slide. So when somebody does genetic testing, there are a few different results that they can get. Negative means we looked at the genes and we didn't see any changes. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that the cancer risk um, is zero because it's just as people, you know, we have a chance. Um, it just means it's may be similar to anybody else in the general population. If it's positive, we found a change. And then at that point we can say, okay, here are the risks for certain types of cancers. Here are some treatment options. Here are some screening options. Um, and then the third type, which we don't get um, as often, but can happen is an uncertain result. So this is when we see a change, but we don't know if it increases the risk for cancer. So like I talked about, some changes are normal between people. Um, so if it's uncertain, it just means, okay, we just have to work with what's in front of us, the personal family history. Um, and then maybe that change will be updated in future years. Next slide. So why might some people want to do genetic testing? It can clarify the risk. Um, it does provide options for man medical management. So if somebody already has a diagnosis of cancer, it may give insight on treatment decisions. 
Um, or it may tell somebody, you know, should you consider um, additional surgery versus chemotherapy? Um, and then there are clinical trials where they are enrolling people based on um, their, if there is a genetic predisposition to cancer. The other thing is it's very helpful for family members. Um, so um, if somebody who has had cancer does testing, and we find something, if we test, like, let's say their child for that exact same change and the child doesn't have it, the child does not have that increased risk for cancer. And so that can be extremely reassuring. They don't necessarily have to do increased screening. Um, on the same hand, if a child is found to have it, or let's say your sister is found to have it, um, then they know, okay, well, then I have some options where I can take extra steps to be proactive. Um, the other is, I will say it's, it's a personal decision. Vision, and that's part of meeting with genetic counselor is to talk about kind of your thoughts, your concerns about genetic testing. Um, and so that they can address some of those and talk to you about if this is something that you want to do. Next slide. So genetic counseling, we'll go to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit about what that is. Um, I know there's been some talks before by genetic counselors with Sisters Network. Um, so some of this may not be any new information, um, but there is a profession right now. I think there's about 6,000 of us in the United States um, for genetic counselors. And really it's helping people understand and adapt to genetic and genetic influences on disease. Um, so it's really genetic counselors have a background in psychosocial counseling and medical genetics. Next slide. So with cancer genetic counseling, what happens is the genetic counselor meets with the patient. Um, you can also bring family members to many of these clinics. Um, some of them are in person. There's a lot of telegenetic options as well. So you can talk to somebody over Zoom or Skype. Um, but really what they're just going to do is ask questions about your uh, personal history. They'll ask about your family history. Um, they'll talk to you just based on what they're seeing in the personal family history, what the chances are of getting cancer. Um, but they'll also talk to you about what the chances are if you did genetic testing, that they would find something there. Um, they can talk about what are some of the screening recommendations, but they can also talk about concerns like, you know, I'm worried about my family members or uh, I'm not sure if I want to test um, somebody else in my family. They may not want to know this information um, or I'm nervous about if something's found, you know, what does that mean for me? And do I have to, what kind of decisions do I have to make at that point? Um, they also have resources for being able to talk to family members about genetic testing because it's not always the easiest. Um, and so that can be helpful as well. There's a national find a genetic counselor tool. So you can look for people in your area, but sisters also has a list um, of uh, black uh, genetic counselors. Um, so that's also a great resource. I think there's um, 30, 40 names of individuals on there as well. Um, and so that's something that we can uh, send out or, or put in the chat. Next slide. So just quickly, let's go over the family history because this is kind of where to start if you haven't done genetic testing or it's not something you've thought about. Um, so if you'll go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about kind of some things to look for. So everybody's cancer risk can be a little bit different and it's um, made up of a bunch of different factors. So some of it's family history, but some of it is um, aging. As we get older, our chance for cancer increases. Sometimes it's environmental exposures. We know that people who have had certain exposures to like radiation or to UV light, that can increase risks as well. Um, so there's a bunch of different things that play a part in somebody's cancer risk. Next slide. So that's why when looking at the family history, these are certain red flags to look out for. These are things that will say, hmm, maybe there's something else going on. It's not just environmental or it's not just lifestyle. So if somebody's had a young cancer, um, so an example is breast cancer younger than 45 or colon younger than 50, there are other types of breast cancer um, that, you know, again, if you see any of them younger than 50, you just may want to take a second look or bring it up with your physician. Um, rare cancers, these are cancers that only happen probably in about, you know, less than 3% of the population, ovarian cancer. Um, a man, male breast cancer, um, pancreatic cancer, sarcoma, those are some of the rare ones to look out for. Um, multiple cancers. So if one person has had two different types of cancer, it may be maybe they've had one breast, a breast cancer in one breast, and then five years later, they have a cancer in the other breast. Um, or it could be something like having both colon and uterine cancer. Um, the other is looking at your family. Are there two or more families that have the same type of cancer? So two or more individuals with breast cancer um, or what we call related. And what we mean by related is there are certain cancer syndromes where we see 
more cancers more often than others. So if we see breast and ovarian, that makes us think of the BRCA genes. Um, if we see something like breast, thyroid, and uterine, that's another type of hereditary cancer syndrome. Um, so those are things to look out for in the family history. Next slide. And I'll show just kind of some pictures. These are um, some things that you may see um, if you go to the genetic counselor when they talk about the family history. So this is the family tree. Squares are men, circles are women. So sporadic cancer means it's cancer that happens by chance. It's not hereditary. And sometimes we know why it happens and sometimes we don't. Typically in these families, we don't see much cancer history. So we may only see like one person, maybe somebody that was diagnosed with older ages. And if you can uh, click through it. So for example, somebody diagnosed with breast cancer at 75, doesn't mean that genetic testing is not an option, just means the likelihood of us finding something on genetic testing is probably pretty low uh, in this family. Next slide. Then there's, yeah, so risk for cancer is average. And then the next slide is family cancer. So this means we're seeing cancer more than by chance alone. And if you'll click again to build it out. Um, but again, it may not be hereditary. So it's kind of a gray area. So we're seeing a few different cancers tend to be older than 50. Um, skin cancer is one where it has a huge environmental component. So being out in the sun, things like that. Um, so that may or may not make us suspicious for hereditary. So if you'll click on the, uh, build, um, most likely somebody like this again could do genetic testing, but the chance that we may find something on genetic testing is low. And then hereditary cancer, if you'll click through one more time, you'll be able to see kind of how this is different than the other two. So we're seeing cancers at younger ages. And all of these cancers are actually what I call related because we know that these cancers are associated with changes in the BRCA gene. So if you'll click through the person um, that's coming in for testing, if they have a mutation, the risk for cancer is likely fairly high. Um, there's up to an 80% chance of breast cancer, potentially up to like a 50% chance, 50 to 60% chance of ovarian. Next slide. So just when you're thinking about taking your own family history, um, it does involve some research. So you wanna think about you know, your relatives, um, have they had any cancers or have they had any other types of conditions, significant um, diseases? What age were they diagnosed with cancer? Um, if you've had relatives who have passed away, um, the genetic counselor is probably gonna ask at what age um, they passed away and what was the cause of death. Um, and then um, they'll probably ask you some questions too about your personal history as well. And then just go through um, and kind of talk to you again, like I said, your risk if they find something on the genetic testing. And I know we'll have some Q&A at the end, and so I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'll turn it back over to Kayleen to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Kate, for um, that very informative um, presentation on genetic uh, counseling and testing. Um, as you mentioned, we have presented this topic, but Again, uh, you're giving a whole nother perspective that uh, just gives even more information to our, our um, stakeholders and our audience. So we do appreciate that um, uh, presentation. Um, thank you again for everyone who's joining us. Again, we are uh, talking about black women, breast cancer, and genetic testing, the importance of knowing your family history. Uh, that is the topic of today's webinar. And I can't uh, wait to introduce you to our uh, next uh, panelist who is a, a dynamic woman in her own right. Um, just I'm reading her bio and I'm like, wow. Um, Shantae Love. Hello, Shantae. <laughs> Shantae Love uh, doesn't strive uh, to just break the mold. She vaults over uh, it, leaving it far behind her in the dust, literally. Uh, this four-time Olympian's impressive rise started while she was just a sophomore at Georgia Tech when she made her first Olympic appearance. Her ambitions on the field and in the classroom showed an unparalleled drive, even among the Institute's top student athletes. Shantae is a world champion and has broken the American record three times, not twice, but three times, um, and is the current American record holder in indoor and outdoor high jump. Wow. She's competed in four Olympic games and um, aspired to add a fifth. In addition to her athleticism, she uh, has used her personal experiences to raise awareness of breast cancer research, early detection, and eradication. In 2019, um, Shantae was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. So this is very personal to Shantae. Um, despite the diagnosis, she continued to train through her surgeries and chemotherapy 
uh, to stay competitive for the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. With the games postponed, she's maintained her, her training, uh, determined to continue to use her voice to bring awareness to breast cancer. She says, quote, the best gift I can give with my life is helping others find beauty in their own lives. Thank you, Shante, uh, for being here today. If you'll take yourself off mute and, you know, we thank you again for being here. You're um, a true champion and uh, not only on the field, but as a breast cancer survivor. And we thank you for bringing your story and, and just, um, you know, being very transparent. So um, the floor is yours. Thank you. That was an amazing introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here because, you know, when you're going through a situation where you're faced with breast cancer, or you have a family member who's facing any type of cancer, um, it's easy to feel very alone and isolated. So having a community like this, a network of sisters who come together and care so deeply about what you're about to go through or what you've been through, either if they're there with you through the fight or with you through your thriving and your recovery, I want to be part of that. So it means a whole lot for me to be able to be here today. Um, I'm a storyteller. So I'm gonna tell you a story really quickly, talk about you know my experience with breast cancer, but let's start with the juicy stuff. Like how did I start jumping in the first place? So I'm watching the Olympics when I'm four years old. And I see this woman on my screen by the name of Flojo. Now, I know a lot of you guys probably know who Flojo is. For those of you who don't, she's the Beyonce of track and field. <laughs> so much so that Beyonce actually dressed up like her for Halloween. And I'm looking at this woman and she has puffy hair, just like me. She has these long, gorgeous nails. And I'm looking at the muscles in this woman's legs. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like strength is gorgeous. And so I'm watching this lady, she lines up behind her blocks, shoots out the back of the track, makes the other women look like they're standing still, points at the clock when she crosses the finish line. And I'm like, that's so disrespectful. But like at the same time, that's super gangster. <laughs> and I'm like, mom, like I want to be just like this woman. Well, my mom tells me it's gonna take hard work and perseverance to become an Olympian. And I'm like, I'm four years old. I don't wanna hear that. And, but my mom was right. As time went on, we faced domestic violence, um, poverty, um, homelessness, and at, at, its, at its peak, you know, incarcerated parents, homelessness, displacement with other relatives. And I did not realize that seeing somebody that looked like me, that sparked something in my heart was going to be exactly what I needed to pull me through the most difficult parts of my life. Um, I ended up staying on the course of trying to become an athlete. And I eventually got to the point where, you know, I studied, I worked hard every day, and I got to try out for my first Olympic team as a sophomore in college. I represented Team USA with pride four times at, in Athens, Greece, Beijing, China, uh, London, somewhere in London, 2012. And then in 2016, I got the opportunity to compete in the Rio Games. And all of those times I went to the Olympics, I got close to the podium and closer to the podium, but didn't quite make it. Um, my last Olympic Games, I was like, you know, a mother of three. I'd been doing this for so many years. And I was like, okay, you know, it's finally time to hang up the spikes. And I go to starting to do a regular job and I don't have the massage therapist no more. I can't write off my manicures anymore. And <laughs> I realize that it's time for me to really partake in personal care. And so I start doing self breast exams because I read an article about a friend of mine who was 34, 35 years old, best shape of her life, just won a gold medal with the Jamaican Olympic team. And she found a stage zero breast cancer because of hereditary, um, hereditary uh, signals in her own life that caused her to check and be proactive. And so I'm like, well, I'm young, but if somebody that young and that fit could get breast cancer, let me start doing breast exams. First two years, nothing, nothing at all. And then at the age of 34, I get this itsy bitsy tiny rice size lump. And I go to the doctor and you know, the first doc, I, I wanna say, I went to the doctor and I tried to get um, an ultrasound and a mammogram. And I was 
told I was going to be turned away if I didn't have somebody in my family that had a history of breast cancer. At that point, I did not. But I knew that there was a lump there. I knew that I was had to do whatever it took to be able to get into that office. And so I, and it, this was so hard for me because I pride myself on integrity, always being honest as possible, but I felt like my life depended on getting this test. And so I said that my mother and my sister had just had a, a brush with breast cancer. They took me in immediately. I got a diagnostic ultrasound and a mammogram. When I got the diagnostic ultrasound and mammogram, and the ultrasound is so important because the mammogram found nothing. And so I get the diagnostic ultrasound and mammogram and they see something there, but the doctor looks at me and he says, um, you need to gain weight. It's a swollen lymph node. You need to gain weight. And I quote, he grabbed his breast and held them up like that as though I could just gain weight in that area. And he sent me home. Now, at this moment, if you've ever been in that situation where you think that the most terrible thing could happen and you find out that you do not have a cancer or, or it's a better report, I was happy. I felt relieved. And something was nagging inside of me for the next 11 months. It's just, ah, oh, it doesn't feel right. If it's a lymph node, I'm doing the detox. I'm doing the Beyonce vinegar and lemon juice and <laughs> It's not working. This thing is getting bigger instead of smaller. What am I doing wrong? I'm going to the sweat box, the sauna, whatever. I'm running every single day. Okay, why is this lymph node not getting smaller? And so that inkling just kept nagging at me and I go in for a second opinion. This time I go to a woman, it is a woman of color. And she looks at me and I, like, even to the point where I almost talked myself out of it. Like, no, I'm tripping. I'm so sorry for even wasting your time. Let me not do this. And she said, no, she was like, no, we're just going to be safe. Let's go in and do another ultrasound and mammogram. And so I got another diagnostic ultrasound and mammogram and I see the technician's face completely turn white. All the blood just leaves his face. And I just know at that moment, I was like, oh, this is not good. They're like, hey, we're going to send you in for a biopsy. And when they send me in for a biopsy, we see that it is invasive ductal carcinoma triple negative breast cancer. And as I began to do the research and learn everything that I could possibly learn about this, I realized that African-American women are predisposed towards having this type of breast cancer. It was a risk that I didn't even know existed. Now, immediately at that moment, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna leave my kids without a mom. And I looked at my husband and I apologized and I was just so heartbroken. He was like, girl, you have been a fighter your entire life. This battle is no different. We are going to fight this and we're gonna fight it together. And so I started digging into the research and learning the one in eight women in their lifetime in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer and the statistics that impact black women. And I had no clue. And I don't know if the doctor dismissed, you know, my symptoms because of my color, but I knew that for whatever reason, I was put in this fight. Now, after having a double mastectomy and chemotherapy, I got to be on the other side where I was, I knew that I was okay, but I kept seeing the faces of my sisters. I kept seeing the faces of the mothers, of the daughters, of the wives that would face this diagnosis. And I realized I had to do something. And so in the midst of that, I decided to switch careers from financial consultant to mother of three, battling breast cancer, training for my fifth Olympic Games because I knew that the Olympic Games was a media conglomerate where I can get that information out for there were so many of us that did not know that we were even in risk. And I get the opportunity now to speak as a motivational speaker. And one of the things, like when I talk to people that are in sales, like, oh, but I don't want people not to like me or this and that. And I was like, if you see somebody running into a burning building, are you gonna say, stop, don't go in there, it is hot. No, you're gonna say, go, stop, stay away, danger. And I felt like it was my job to take whatever platform that I had possible to be able to get the information out about early detection and awareness. And, and, and when I felt like I was in the clear, I looked at my two baby girls and I was like, oh my gosh, 
Now I have to think about their lives. I have to see if there's any way that what's going on with me could impact their future. And so I knew that it was very, very important to take on genetic testing through a partnership as a global ambassador for the American Cancer Society. I was introduced to Quest Diagnostics and they were so eager to hear and share my story. But then they started asking me questions about genetic testing. And I realized they were asking me questions that even when I went through my treatment, I was never asked. I was never offered the opportunity to have a genetic counselor and to sit down and see if there was any reason why I got this cancer. I just felt like it was something I was never going to have an answer to. And when I sat down and I did the genetic testing um, and or the genetic counseling, I didn't realize that I had an uncle that died of colon cancer, grandfather who died of prostate cancer. And it was just on one side of my family, there were a lot of different people who had it, even though it wasn't breast cancer. And I started getting the information that Kate shared with us today, where it doesn't necessarily have to be a breast cancer, but it could be a related cancer. And, um, you know, the reality is this after you face this type of diagnosis, you feel so grateful for every day of your life, the day that you get to breathe and be on this side of life with your family, you appreciate it as a gift, but you feel a responsibility. Like I am a firm believer that I am my sister's keeper. And it's so important with the information that we have to be able to get on panels like this and to share and to talk and disseminate information because we all need each other. We're all different parts of the same body working together towards the same goal of eradicating cancer, beating it and thriving in our own lives. And, you know, while I didn't make it to my fifth Olympic games, I ended up getting COVID right before the Olympic trials. I had a sense of joy and pride and fulfillment because the more important battle, which was letting women know that we have hope and there are resources available in connecting women through a sense of community and letting them know that they're not alone. That was so much more fulfilling for me than any Olympic medal ever could be. So um, that's, you know, that's my story in a nutshell. I am so eager to hear all of your guys' questions. I'm long with it. So I'm trying real hard to cut myself <laughs> short. <laughs> well, thank you. That was a powerful, powerful story. And, and just to hear your journey through how you became an Olympian and then, you know, how you faced breast cancer when you had one of the biggest challenges of your life in front of you. And to your point, um, just before we start taking some of these questions, which we have a lot of great questions coming in, Kate and um, Shantae, so uh, prepare yourselves. I just want to give <laughs> you a glimpse of what our statistics are that we're dealing with. And Shantae mentioned she's triple negative. If you'll notice on our Black Women and, and Breast Cancer Facts and Figures, which is on our website, you'll see that Black women have a 2.3 times higher odds of being diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, which Shantae mentioned that she uh, was diagnosed. Um, you know, we're 42% more likely to die of breast cancer. Um, and it's one of the most common cancers among black women. Um, so we, we, we have a crisis women. Um, my sisters in this, in this, in this um, webinar today, just know that we have a, a crisis amongst black women and we need to uh, continue to educate ourselves. We need to be advocates. Um, we, when we feel something's not right, we need to take action and we need to know our history. And so we're going to jump right into some of these questions. Um, let's see, first, let's say, let's see, let's see. So, um, first of all, let me just acknowledge, um, our Montgomery, Alabama affiliate chapter president, um, Letitia uh, uh, McClenney, she says, good afternoon, not a question, but excellent information. I have benefited from genetic testing and genetic counseling. Uh, so we thank you for sharing that um, information. Um, the first question we have is from um, Ms. Heron, and she says, thank you so much for the valuable information. Question, please. NF1 gene, does it cause breast cancer or relate it to breast cancer like the BRCA um, uh, half gene? Yeah, and I, I attempted to answer this in the, the Q&A, um, so I don't know if it popped through or not. NF1 is associated with a condition called neurofibromatosis, where you might see um, typically some benign tumors, but some 
can be cancerous types of tumors. There is a risk for breast cancer. It's not as high as with the BRCA1 and 2. And then I did see that she had a follow-up question about a VUS or a variant of uncertain significance. Um, I will say that we tend to see a VUS probably more in people of color. Um, and part of that is due because we have genetic databases where we collect all these genetic changes and see how they track with disease and severity of disease. Um, and unfortunately, the databases that were created and some of them were 20 plus years ago were predominantly done in white Europeans. So we don't have a lot of data in other ethnic groups. Um, there are initiatives right now that are happening with it. Um, the National Institutes of Health has the All of Us Research Campaign, um, which is to try to diversify genetic databases. Um, there's also one, I believe it's called A3, um, where they're working specifically on African genetic changes and genomes. Um, so I would say if you've had a VUS before, that's a great reason to go in and talk to a genetic counselor, um, if, even if you have already. Um, check in every year because sometimes they get reclassified. Um, most of the time they get reclassified and they're benign changes, meaning they don't increase the risk of disease. But if you have a VUS on a test result, it's always a good idea. Just yearly call in and see if anything's changed. Okay, another question that's come up is how often should genetic testing be done? And that's a great question. Really change throughout our life. Um, so, you know, on one hand, you could say, okay, well, it's not necessarily need to test it. But what does change is our technology and how we test those genes. So, for example, 20 years ago, we only knew about BRCA1 and 2 for hereditary breast cancer. Now there's roughly around 25 to 30 genes. So, if you had genetic testing, I would say five or more years ago, it's good to revisit it with your doctor or genetic counselor and to see if better technology uh, is available or if new genes have been identified. Okay. Shantae, I'm going to uh, put a question to you. Um, did your doctor talk to you about genetic counseling or did you take that upon yourself? No. So my doctor did not talk to me about it. It wasn't until I embarked on a partnership with Quest that they were informing, we were just coming across the conversation and they asked, well, you know, were you offered genetic testing? Were you offered genetic counseling? And I was like, no, you know, they tested the tumor once, you know, throughout the mastectomy, but there was nobody that came in and talked about the results with me. And so that's something that I was able to do afterwards um, through Quest. Okay. Which is really sad. <laughs> I was going to say, and Shantae, unfortunately, we hear that. And that's one of the things we talk about is with Black women, they're diagnosed at younger ages and at triple negative. And I think, Shantae, when you and I talked, you were saying your doctor at first thought you were just too young, that it couldn't yep. happen. Too yeah. young. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, Kate, quick question. So what, why, are, why do you think that we're being referred less to the genetic testing? Is it just a... Yeah. I mean, what do you think? So, what I mean, <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I said, what, why do you think that's the case? And what do you think that can be done other than us being proactive on for ourselves? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question. I don't think there's necessarily one answer. I can say that some of the studies I talked about at the beginning with the figures, um, some of it is that um, it's physicians, there are certain physicians just across the board that don't think about genetic testing. So when we're looking at big centers, it may show a difference. But if you looked at that one physician, you may see that one physician only refers one out of 10 people, maybe that meet criteria. Mm -hmm. um, so they're just not aware. I think the other is, and that some of them have found, is that there's a concern that, um, that some folks assume um, that people of color um, either don't have insurance and testing is too expensive and they can't afford it, which is not the case. That Again, that may have been the case 20 years ago but the cost of genetic testing has significantly dropped. Um, so it's, some of it is, I think, just you know, being uh, naive and then some of it's just willfully being ignorant. Um, I can tell you that some of the things that are being done right now are just to increase awareness and education, some of these physician groups. Um, so with the American Society of Clinical Oncology, I know they're, they're um, working hard in this area. 
Um, the other is, so for example, like with Quest, we have a, a community outreach program called Quest for Health Equity. And one of the things that we're doing um, is trying to reach, um, you know, HBCUs um, and educate folks there um, as patients, but then also trying to reach out to large academic medical centers to try to reach the physicians that are treating patients today so that they're aware um, of genetic testing. And it's to the point that honestly, family history is helpful, but we're getting to the point where a lot of people don't even necessarily need to have the family history um, because there's starting to be some discussion about should everybody who's had breast cancer just get genetic testing um, since we are missing so many people and so many people are not getting referred the way that they should be. Okay, so let me uh, put out this question and thank you to our triangle chapter uh, out of North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina. Portia is, um, has a question and she's on this, this webinar. She says, all wonderful information. I have never had genetic testing. Can you still have genetic testing years after diagnosis? Yes, so anytime. Um, so it's always, it's available. It's just looking at your blood or saliva. So like I said, your, your genes aren't changing. So if you've had a diagnosis, I think that's a good time to, uh, it's to contact a genetic counselor and talk to them about it. The other thing I will also say is if you've previously had genetic testing and you never had the genetic counseling, you can still go in and talk to a genetic counselor. So whether you've had testing or not, um, if you have questions, um, you can set up an appointment. Uh, this question comes from uh, Ms. Wills. She says, at what age do you, should you have your children tested if you have the genetic markers? Yeah, that's another good question. So with kids, typically with certain genes like BRCA, um, most uh, guidelines don't recommend testing younger than 18. Um, there's a few reasons. One is we want to make sure that the person who's doing the testing kind of understands like, hey, if I find something, this may mean I may have to make certain decisions. So we want them to be able to understand kind of what can happen post-testing. Um, the other is because the risk for some of those cancers, we don't really start seeing it until like the 20s. Um, so it is extremely unusual to see it being diagnosed younger than probably 2025. Um, but I will say there are certain genes like the one NF1 that was mentioned. Mm -hmm. Neurofibromatosis, while we may not be concerned about breast cancer um, and people younger than 18, there are risks for other types of growths um, or benign tumors. So something like NF1, you may want to test younger than 18. So it partly depends on the gene um, as, as when may be the most helpful to get tested. So again, I think that's a good question too, for like a genetic counselor is to think about the gene and they can tell you, look, this is one where there have been cases and we need to start screening. There's some sort of screening option. We can start at age 12 or 13, uh, versus waiting till like 20 or 25. Okay, we have about 10 to 12 minutes left. I'm going to pull some of these questions. There will be a poll that will be coming up in maybe about three to five minutes. And if you would please take it to help us understand how much this information is informative or not, and we're missing the mark, we want to make sure that what we're bringing to you is always useful. So when the, the poll comes up, we really encourage you to take a moment just to take its four or five quick questions. Uh, Ms. Wills did have a follow-up question, uh, Kate, and it was, uh, she was diagnosed at 28 with colon cancer, survived currently 47, stomach and peritoneal, can per peritoneal cancer. Peritoneal. Uh, peritoneal, think. thank you. There we go. <laughs> struggling there. I am about to have a mammogram. Are there any other tests in relation to breast cancer that are helpful in detecting? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I would definitely say the mammogram is probably the place to start, but I think like with Shantae's story, you heard that, you know, uh, an ultrasound can be helpful. The other thing I know we were discussing on our call yesterday is 3D mammograms. So there's something called 3D mammograms. They may call it a tomosynthesis, um, but instead of 2D where they're just kind of looking a level at a time, it kind of allows them to scroll through the different kind of levels of the breast tissue. Um, and it can pick up some things that a regular mammogram may miss. The other thing I would also say, having colon cancer at 28, that's a pretty young age. It also can be related to stomach and peritoneal as far as a hereditary cancer syndrome. So I would strongly encourage you to talk to a genetic counselor um, because there are genetic tests where we are concerned more about things like colon, stomach, peritoneal types of cancers as well. So not BRCA, but maybe some other genes. Okay, Paulette Henry has a specific question for Shantae. It says, Shantae, did your history of high level of physical training help you through your recovery? 
absolutely. That's a fantastic question. Yes, um, being able to be in shape. Um, I noticed that I was able to work out after chemotherapy, after training. Um, my doctor even gave me guidelines. And so a lot of the severe neurop neuropathy that many women were experiencing that also had the same type of chemotherapy treatment as me, um, it was not as prevalent in, in me when I was training. So I was able to stay in front of a lot of those really harsh symptoms. And then um, I also wanted to take it back to the other question when they were asking about the age of the genetic testing. I have had so many family members that were even teens that might have find benign um, lumps in their breasts. I have sent my report toward their doctors. And mm -hmm. so that's something that even if they're too young to get testing themselves, it's valuable information. I've probably sent my results to five different female family members that wanted to discuss with their doctors. So it's, it's still useful in that regard, even if they're not being tested. Okay. I would say, and that's a good point because even if they're not ready yet for testing, they may still be able to do additional screening. So it's good for them to talk and share with the doctor. Uh, Bridgette, if you'll launch the poll, and I'm going to give you a couple more questions. One was, uh, what does the different stages of breast cancer mean? This is from Faye uh, B. So um, typically they mean kind of how invasive it is. Um, so stage zero is usually like kind of um, grown too much and it's fairly small in size. Um, stage uh, one and two can be a little bit bigger in size. Um, they may have taken up a, a more of a portion of the breast. Um, I believe stage three, and I'm not an oncologist, but stage three is typically when we see it in the lymph nodes. So what happens is it starts kind of in the breast tissue, then it may go to a lymph node. It may only go to like one or two, but then if it spreads beyond that and we see in other areas of the body, that's stage four, what we call metastatic. Um, where we see that it's spread outside of the breast and throughout other parts of the body. Okay, and we have a question from Ms. Wade. It says, I'm a nine-year survivor and the only one in my family di that was diagnosed with breast cancer. Should my sister who is older and, and my niece who is 36 get a genetic, te get genetic, genetic test even though I uh, didn't have the genetic strain when I was tested? Yeah, I would say that they can certainly have it if it's something they're concerned about. I think the hard part is, is if those individuals come back negative, we don't necessarily know more than we do today. Um, the chance that they would come back positive is probably unlikely since you had negative testing. So probably what makes sense is since it's, you know, I think I heard nine year survivor, um, go back and maybe revisit. Is there any additional genetic testing? Like I said, technology has changed in those last years. So you can see if there's any genetic testing available. Um, if they want it, you know, it's something they can certainly talk to their doctors. Uh, like I said, it just, it's a low chance, but they may test negative. Um, and maybe as to Shantae's point, they may still want to do increased screening because if you've had it, you test negative, there's still that familial cancer where we're not sure what caused it, but we know there's increased more than what we would see by chance alone. So it's a good idea just to have them have that conversation about maybe increased screening. Someone says, what website for testing, I guess, to get information about uh, mm -hmm. where they can find testing? Yeah, the um, find a genetic counselor.com that tool um, it takes you to um, about genetic counselors and there's some helpful stuff there about genetic testing but I know sisters I believe also has resources about genetic testing there are multiple labs that do it um, so it really is starting with the provider um, and kind of where your insurance may may have a lab they prefer um, or the provider may recommend one of the labs for testing Okay. Again, that poll is still open. I hope that we are getting almost 100% uh, uh, participation. We're going to start wrapping it up, but I do want to acknowledge Ms. Lynch has a question. It says, having had pancreatic cancer, should I ask about genetic testing? Absolutely. Pancreatic cancer is one of those ones that's a little bit more uncommon. Um, and so uh, that is definitely one where you would want to talk to your provider or genetic counselor about testing. Shantae, is there anything else you'd like to add to the conversation? Um, we're going to be starting to wrap up, but I want to hear your uh, kind of final thoughts with the ladies. Oh, I'm extremely thankful that um, you guys are here and doing this and, and you're asking amazing questions. Just continue to ask questions. If you do not feel satisfied with your solution or the level of care that you're getting, 
keep going until you get that. You know, for me, if I would have not, if I would have just listened to the first doctor and not went back for a second opinion, things could have been a lot worse for me. I'm still not 40. I would not have had my first mammogram for two more years. So, um, you know, you guys are your first advocate, your first level of defense, share information with each other, continue to come back to these meetings, these wonderful meetings, because you're going to get valuable information that will help you. So um, I love you and I'm so grateful. Thank you for having me today. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Shante. Quick um, comment from, I mean, the question from that I overlooked. Uh, when should, this is from Miss Goodwin. When should a young lady start yearly mammograms? So right now, um, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends it starting at 45. Um, it used to be 40. Um, I still get mine starting at 40. I don't wait till 45. So I think, again, that's something kind of you have to talk about with your doctors. Most OBs that I've worked with um, have referred people at 40. If you have a family history and there's no genetic change or mutation, the rule of thumb is to start 10 years earlier uh, than the first diagnosis. So in Shantae's case, if she was diagnosed at 35, then her daughter should probably start screening at 25. It may be with ultrasound first um, and then mammogram, um, but that's really when you should start doing some of the screening is 10 years before the earliest person. Okay, here's a couple quick more comments. Um, uh, Ms. Bryant, if you want to email us at Sisters Network uh, regarding what you're needing uh, in terms of educational material, we can tell you how to access it from um, our, our website. Uh, Ms. Carol Corum, she says she's from Seattle, Washington. She's the lead ambassador for ACS CAN. How does one account for childhood cancer? I'm not sure. Yeah, and it's so uh, some of it can be due to a genetic mutation like this. What we find is it's a genetic mutation that's not inherited. So meaning it's not passed from mom or dad to the kiddos. It's something that's new in that kiddo. Um, so maybe it happened and there was an error in one of the cells that just happened by random chance. Um, but I will say um, most pediatric oncology centers now are doing um, fairly broad genetic testing in children. Um, they haven't necessarily seen a significant increase in hereditary cancers, um, but they also do that because sometimes it gives them more treatments to decide. Um, and then I will say, I saw another comment that somebody said that it's exhausting to continue to advocate for yourself and, and to be with physicians that aren't listening. Um, and all I can say is I, I can't, uh, I can imagine, um, and I also can't imagine, and it is, it's really frustrating. And I do feel that healthcare as a whole needs to continue to look at itself and to keep doing a better job. Thank you so much, Kate, for that. And just um, we put it in the chat that if you know if you can let us know any other topics you'd love for Sisters Network to bring to you in the future, you know whatever it is, we'll try to see if we can get our um, esteemed medical experts to address specific topics of, of interest uh, to continue to keep you informed, engaged, and empowered. Um, Ms. Williams says American College of Radiology recommends 40 years of age to begin annual screening for average risk patients. We are the doctors who find the breast cancer on mammograms and ultrasound and MRI. So thank you for that information, mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Williams. Um, and then Ms. Hornbuckle says, I was diagnosed twice before age 40. It's so important to stay on top of our breast health. Absolutely. Like we said, Shantae is a prime example. And, and then Mrs. Hornbuckle, you know, we've got women who are being diagnosed well before the, uh, the guidelines, whether you have risk or you don't have risk. Um, so we, we have to um, know our bodies, uh, take action and be informed so that we can advocate for ourselves when we don't um, feel like we're, um, something's not right with our body. Um, again, we're um, thankful today for both Kate and Shantae for uh, participating in this uh, important discussion that's been powered by Quest Diagnostics. It's been about Black women, breast cancer, and genetic testing, knowing your family history. And um, I, you know, I just can't say thank you enough. I think we were at almost 90% on our participation uh, with our poll. We always strive for 100% in anything we do at Sisters Network. So we would love for you ladies to help us get there before we get off. Um, but quick shout out to a couple of other chapters that were on here. Again, I said the Montgomery, Alabama uh, chapter uh, had representation, Triangle, North Carolina, Durham Triangle, 
uh, uh, North Carolina chapter, our Chicago chapter had um, a representative here, and um, we are just really, really appreciative of everybody that um, comes. And we've got some suggestions on topics looks like uh, they want to see more about triple negative breast cancer, a topic on um, uh, breast cancer receptors, ER, PR, H2. Uh, we have one coming up October 8th. If you go on our website, you'll see that uh, available for you to register. Again, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Shante. Sisters Network is here to serve, um, to be um, an advocate for uh, women across the country, our sisters, as Shante said, we are our sister's keeper. And um, we don't take that lightly. And thank you, Greensboro. Some of our chapters are starting to want to be acknowledged. Y'all are late. I told y'all to say this early in the game, but I'm going to acknowledge you. <laughs> Uh, we have Greensboro, North Carolina. Thank you so much for being here. Austin chapter representative. Thank you so much for being here. Again, um, Sisters Network is here to serve. Please go on our website. We have a lot of information out there. And um, we will be having our national walk next year, April 29th. Please save the date. You'll be getting more information about that. Next month, our breast cancer assistance program will be opening where we provide financial assistance to survivors across the country. If you have not applied in the last year, please look at the application when it becomes live next month. Uh, thank you, Essex County, for being here. Sisters Network Essex County members. Uh, for being on, on the call today too. Again, thank you ladies. If there's any last parting words and thank you again to our, our partner and friends at Quest. Um, you know, Kate, thank you, Melissa and Andrea, if you're on, I appreciate you all ladies too and, and for bringing us and introducing us to Shante, who has shared a very powerful journey um, and story. Her testimony has been very inspiring. Um, and, you know, this is a woman who's very athletic, very healthy, um, and, but, you know, she was diagnosed and she, she faced it and she's, she's using her voice to amplify um, the importance of breast cancer awareness. So thank you again and have a wonderful, wonderful remaining part of the weekend. And I hope I'm at 100%. I know we were at 90 something, so I'll, I'll take that today. <laughs> thank you, ladies. Have a wonderful afternoon. Be well. <laughs>